Much of the Hanford nuclear site is free from contamination. It's still restricted land, though, and ill-equipped for visitors. It is an industrial site, so it's not made for the public. A lot of the materials that were used back during this construction are considered hazardous now. They have been mitigated back for the public, but we do have asbestos, we have mercury, we have lead. Few who didn't work here ever get to visit. Hanford B Reactor, birthplace of America's nuclear weapons program. Until recently, the tour was only open to US citizens. We are the first British film crew allowed. This is the main attraction. The reactor face contained more than 2,000 nuclear fuel tubes. It's unprecedented scale driven by the urgency of war. Behind this face, there's a 50-inch thick shield. Behind that shield, there are huge blocks of graphite like this, much bigger than this, and that's what the tubes of fuel would go into, made of aluminium with uranium inside them, much, much bigger than this. They'd be inserted into there, and then the chain reaction would take place on the other side, creating the plutonium for the bombs. Spent fuel rods were ejected into water and cooled, the same water, now contaminated, was stored on site. It's now part of the waste problem. But those who worked here say safety was paramount. Everybody that was in uh, an area where you might get contaminated, you had a urine sample every week. Now, there was a lot of concern, corporately, if, if you will. Every time we got a, some number of thousands of hours of uh, without a lost time injury, then everybody got a safety prize all 6,000 of us. I got a hair clipper one year, one year I got a giant pair of pliers that I still have. Um, I've forgotten other things of that sort. They were like $10 things. They weren't, you know, huge things, but everybody got one. This was the control room, the nerve center of the entire operation. Today, tourists marvel at 1940s know-how. Quickly they went into another safety Instruments that look arcane to us were the cutting-edge technology of their day. So you have this amazing set of machinery that it's got a gas system and a water system and all of this and 300 tons of uranium fuel and it actually works. After World War II, eight more reactors were built at Hanford. The site produced two-thirds of America's weapons-grade plutonium. Now tourists can see what's left. The Cold War was our longest war, our most expensive, and people want to know its history. So it's a kind of increase in nuclear tourism, if you like. Yes, it is. I mean, this is the battlefield of the Cold War. This is where bricks and mortar and people's lives came together and actually fought that war. But what do you think about all these tourists coming here now? Oh, I think it's awesome that um, the, they get an opportunity finally to get out on the Hanford site to see what uh, our forefathers did and how they did it and the, the, um, what they were able to accomplish in such a short period of time. There were so many people here creating such a power, such an amazing power, and now here we are using it as a tourist attraction. It kind of baffles me. Most of Hanford's nine reactors have been dismantled or encased in concrete. B reactor has been preserved and more tours are planned. Here's your cherries already. Oh, uh, yeah. There are some who are not proud of the cloud. Gloria Wise grew up near Hanford. At that time, scientists knew much less about radiation's lingering effects. She developed thyroid cancer as a result of radioactive gas released from the site. I can't believe that they could do something without our knowledge, without our permission. I was lucky enough to have my uh, cancer removed. As it is, I'm on thyroid medicine for the rest of my life, and I, it has to be adjusted periodically. I have bouts where I get really tired, and, and then sometimes my hair starts falling out. Gloria's part of a group called the Downwinders, some 2,000 people who filed a lawsuit claiming Hanford caused their illnesses. Some cases are pending, but Gloria is one of only two who have won compensation. 
I mean, I'm glad to have won, of course, because uh, we're going to continue to have medical problems, and it's, you need the, I need the money to, to help me down the road. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of a hollow victory because two out of 2,000 is not very good statistics. Nearby, it's an important feast day for the Umatilla Indians, who fished the Columbia River for thousands of years. The salmon were the first people that the Creator um, asked to give up their lives for us. And uh, the salmon gladly offered up their lives for our, our people. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Tribe member and fish biologist Stuart Harris believes radioactive contamination is hurting the fish and his people. We don't have as much salmon as we did back in the 50s and the 40s. We don't have as much. That's part of the problem. Uh, we suspect because of our lifestyle that we're, we're being exposed in a unique way that other people aren't because of, we eat so much salmon. At the Spring Root Feast, the tribe honors traditional foods, including salmon. They believe their ancestors return as the food they eat, an ancient bond now under threat. They are so important, they are so embedded within our culture and our religion and our laws that if people said if the salmon were gone and we couldn't eat the salmon, then we would be gone, we would perish. The government did something, you know, so they could stop a war. I'm sure that that's, that's important. But to pollute the river in such a way where people can receive radiation doses and not be told about it, that's not proper. And they should have been told. We should have had more protection, and we didn't. But it's like we were sacrificed for national security. Rattlesnake Mountain is sacred ground for the Umatilla Indians. We had to have special permission to go up, not from the tribe, but from the US government. It's within the Hanford nuclear site. There's reactors all along the river. There were Dave Brockman is in charge of cleanup operations here. It's a $2 billion a year task, dealing with nearly half a century of deliberate and accidental contamination on a massive scale. We treat some 35 to 40 million gallons of water each month here. So there's just vast quantities underneath the site that are contaminated that we need to clean up. What do you say to people who are concerned at the speed of the cleanup? Environmentalists, for example, worried about the levels of um, heavy metals in the fish in the river. There are people that are not happy with the, the speed of cleanup. You know, sometimes I'm not happy either, but people have to understand that the people that come out here and go to work every day are put in some very hazardous situations and we're gonna make darn sure they're safe and the other thing is we find more than we expected but uh, so there's actually more than you thought yeah we'll dig it we're, we dig up a lot of old landfills and we'll look through the records and, and I think on average we're 10 to 15 percent more or unexpected things than we knew so we're used to that we know how to adjust for that but it does take more time and it does take more money now more money is available and look at the results at a local recruitment fair. As many as 4,000 jobs could be created thanks to $2 billion extra from President Obama's economic stimulus package. An economic chain reaction is on its way for an area tied to the past. Um, we've had ups and downs uh, depending on the funding that comes from the government. So if we are able to get additional funding for Hanford, um, during this time, that's great for the locals. You feel bad for other parts of the country. As a merchant, I'm, I'm thankful. We're going to see a nice impact for, you know, at least for that two years. It's probably going to run on to about another four years off of that as the money continues to cycle itself through the community. Good for you as well? Definitely good for us. The creation of destruction brought prosperity here. Cleaning up after it will do so again. Good times in an area that can't and won't deny its history. My mom was a bomber. 
As a school, we don't really focus on the history all the time, but I think it's something that everyone knows about, and I think it's something that we're unique for, because I think a, a lot of schools aren't um, aware of the history of their mascot, or maybe their mascot has no history. America's most controversial experiment has left a unique and lasting legacy.